Um, what is up everybody? So uh, for this one we are going to be learning about how to start running. A lot of people want to start running but it might be a little overwhelming so uh, I'm a big fan of doing the easiest form of exercise well not working harder than you need to work. So we're going to figure out the easiest way for you to get into exercise and how to do it uh, appropriately I guess. So all right hello everybody. So let's uh, switch over to my sheet here. Okay, so when we're talking about how to start running, and again, you only have to watch two of these uh, for your grade this week, or you can watch a third one for extra credit. So, all right, let's jump right in. So, for um, learning how to start running, and I guess really any activity, doing a macro overview of what you're trying to do is kind of beneficial. So, I'm going to do that real quick for us here. So, this is time down here and let's let's use red for intensity and then let's use blue for volume okay so volume right here means how much you're actually running so that could be five miles a week, it could be 60 miles a week, everybody's gonna be at a different spot. Intensity means how fast or how hard you're working during those runs. So when you are starting out training, uh, especially with running, we want volume to be quite low because your body's gonna have to adapt to that. So again, this is a starting running video, so your volume is gonna go like this and then slowly creep up over time. I would even add some little undulations in there where you take some easier weeks and you get the idea. So you're slowly building your volume over time. When we look at intensity right away, we want intensity to stay very low, at least when we're running, because we're just trying to develop some run, some you know, cardio and just some base fitness. And as you get more fit, you can start adding intensity in as well. So this is gonna look a lot different than if you were training for a marathon. In that video, we're gonna talk a lot more about how to really boost performance. But for learning how to run and how, starting, this is kind of what you wanna do. So slowly building your distance or your time. I like to run based on time rather than distance. And then building that intensity very gradually, almost no intensity when you're starting. Okay, so next, uh, the next question is, what makes a good runner? And I put strength number one, which might surprise a lot of people. The reason why I put strength right there is because depending on whether you want to be a sprinter or a distance runner, you're going to need strength either way because a lot of times when I see people out running on the green belt, they're, they're just not strong enough to be able to run with good form. And a lot of times when we're thinking about running form, we typically think about, um, well, we typically think about how we should hold our bodies while we're running. But my uh, idea is that if you are strong enough, you're going to hold your body a lot better um, already, right? Now, there could be a little bit of technique you could do when you're out running, but for the most part, just increasing your strength overall. So the way we can do this, there's a few things. Uh, you know, we can do body weight workouts, which you guys might have to do right now since we're quarantined. Um, you know, any type of, I think the weight room is huge. Excuse this spelling here. I think the weight room is huge for for runners, uh, sprinters, uh, marathon runners, everybody, all of the above. So I'm a big fan of being strong so you can run well. This, a lot of people think, oh, this is leg strength, right? Oh, yeah, yeah, John, uh, good question. So. Uh, yeah, take a page of notes while you do this, one to two pages, and upload it for this video, but also ask one question. So you're doing both. All right, good. Thank you for that. So a lot of people think about lower body strength, which is definitely important, but I like to think about strength as full body strength. A lot of people think upper body strength is not important for runners, but I think uh, in my experience, when I've strengthened my upper back, particularly my shoulders, when I've got my upper back strong and I could keep my shoulders back that made my arm carry a lot better and it made running seem way easier a lot of times when you see runners especially when they get tired they start to cross over like this that is less efficient it doesn't feel as good you're gonna run slower and it's gonna make your life just just way harder so uh, yep 
great question about body weight exercises. I'm going to create some exercises for you guys in a second after we go over this. So, uh, yeah, so you want to be strong when you start running. Another thing that goes along with this is that you want to be strong for your body weight. So, you know, a lot of runners are, I think, too skinny out there. I think if they added some strength, they would actually have better form. Uh, but if you are a little heavier, then you're going to need more strength, right? And that's not a bad thing, right? You can be um, have a little extra weight, right? Because sometimes that is healthier than being too skinny. Uh, but don't neglect the weight room because if you do, uh, you're just not going to run as well. Uh, the risk of injury is high. That's the other reason why I have strength here is injury resistance. So the stronger you are, the stronger your bones and your ligaments and your muscles are, the less likely it is that you're going to get injured. And so that's why I put strength number one. All right, next let's look at VO2 max. So most people think about VO2 max when they think of runners. This is how much oxygen your body can deliver to your muscles. And the more oxygen you can deliver, the more efficient you're going to be. And this has to do with muscle fiber type, which I'll talk about in a second. But this is... Uh, measured in milliliters of oxygen per kilogram of body weight per minute. So average numbers, I mean, for your college distance runners, I would say women are about uh, 50 to 60, uh, even up to 70 if you have really elite women. And then for men, you're looking at uh, 60 to 70, and then up towards the 80s, for elite men, uh, 70s for elite women. Okay, so basically what you're training here is we have mitochondria in our cells, you know, the powerhouse of the cell. Those guys use oxygen to pr produce energy. And so uh, people who have a high VO2 max have a high capacity to produce mitochondria and to use, use that oxygen. Um, when we think about VO2 max, a lot of people think, well, how do I improve this, right? Well, you improve this by doing high intensity workouts, right? Hit training like we created. Although a lot of VO2 max is actually genetic. So your parents gave you a certain set of DNA and that kind of dictates how high your VO2 max is. Uh, so for me personally, my VO2 max was 72, um, which is pretty decent. And so that was genetic, right? I trained and obviously made that better, but you know, I can thank my parents for that. Uh, some people are gonna have a different set of um, Genetics, that doesn't mean you can't be you know, a really good runner, but uh, there is a genetic role in here. You can only improve your VO2 max about 10%. So there is um, some, you know, there is some improvement, but you have a ceiling there. Uh, also, would HIIT workouts be beneficial? Yes, so that's how we're gonna improve our VO2 max, and I'm gonna make some HIIT workouts for you guys in a second. So uh, the other thing you're improving is lactic threshold. And in order to explain these two concepts here, I'm actually gonna draw a glass of water. Okay, and let's say our glass is this full right here. All right, so your VO2 max, like I just said, is kind of your genetic potential, right? And you can improve that again by just about 10%, maybe 20%, but somewhere in between there. And so this is fairly genetic. So your Olympians, they're born, right? They're not made. Well, they do work hard after they were born with that genetic set. Your lactic threshold is how well you can utilize carbohydrates, which allow you to run faster, and how well you can remove all the metabolites that build up in your system uh, when you are trying to run faster. So as you're running, you're out there, you're going nice and easy, you're using some fat, you're using some carbs all the time. As you start running harder, you're gonna start burning more carbs. And so this starts to produce lactic acid. And if you've ever been working out hard and you feel that burning feeling, that's gonna be your lactic acid building up. So when you're doing HIIT workouts, like we made last week, you're actually boosting your VO2 max and you're boosting your lactic threshold. And when I talked about uh, this, let me throw it up on the screen here, this RPE, this rate of perceived exertion, like how hard you're working during your workouts, if you're working at like a seven or above, then you're gonna be training your lactic threshold and your VO2 max. And so one of the keys that we're gonna talk about is, you know, for most of your days, you're gonna be just working out easy. And then a few days a week, you wanna work out hard so you can improve your VO2 max and your lactic threshold. So uh, as you train then, let's get rid of this. As you train, 
your lactic threshold is going to rise. And this now, this new area here, is how much faster you can run. So as you get your lactic threshold higher through training, then you're going to perform better and running is going to be easier for you. So you're going to be able to run faster with less, uh, less effort. And again, that's what HIT training is going to do for us. And so we'll, we'll make some workouts for that. So these are the two uh, primary drivers of performance increases in distance runners or runners in general. I mean, not sprinters, I guess, but uh, anything above a sprint. All right, now let's look at muscle fiber type. So the two main types of muscle fibers are type 1 and type 2. Type two or type one is our slow twitch muscle fibers, and for anybody running like marathons or half marathons, the more type one you have, the better off you're going to be. This is like VO2 max; it's very genetic. So whatever your parents gave you, as far as your muscle breakdown, the uh, that's kind of how um, I guess genetics influences it. So type one are smaller muscle fibers, but they're more efficient with oxygen. So your really good distance runners have lots of type one fibers. Type 2 fibers produce power and speed. So, you know, you never have just one type of fiber. You have, you know, a breakdown. Most people are about 50-50. So, unfortunately, if you're 50-50, that doesn't make you a great athlete because you're kind of trapped in the middle between two worlds. Now, you can still become a really good runner, but you're not going to the Olympics if you have a 50-50 split. Whereas if you're a sprinter, right, you're going to have 90%, if you have 90%, type 2, you're going to be a lot faster than if you have, you know, 90% type 1 where you're going to have a lot more endurance. So we can't do a whole lot about that with strength training. We can train our muscle fibers to become, you know, faster and higher response. And that actually leads us right down into power. So building our power, well, I should explain what power is. Power is speed plus strength, maybe time strength. So how quick you can react and how strongly you can react. That's going to determine power. And so if you think about jump, when you think about running, you're doing a bunch of tiny little jumps over and over and over again. And when you're jumping, jumping is like the best, me well, a really good measure of power output. So how fast your muscle fiber can contract and then how hard it can contract. And so if we boost your power up, let's, let's go back to this model over here. Let's say you're running at... Uh, at uh, five miles an hour at your old lactic threshold. And now let's say you don't improve your lactic threshold, but you improve your power, which means you're gonna go a little bit farther with each step. Your power is actually gonna jump up to here. And then now you can run you know, at 5.5 miles an hour at your lactic threshold. So that's kind of why strength is important. And then if you add some power element to it as well. So um, you can get this by speed, speed training, you can do this by box jumps. Uh, jump rope, all kinds of things like that. Let me let me check out the comments real quick here. Oh yeah, stretching. Uh, we're going to talk about that at the end. So save your comments and then, or well, keep them coming, um, and then I'm going to go over those as I see fit. So let's make some workouts here. So how to become strong is the first question. So when you're starting out, maybe let's just start from baseline. We just need a beginner plan. The great news about starting out as a um, person who hasn't been exercising very much is actually that you don't need to do a whole lot of training in order to get really good improvements because your, your gains are just real quick. Let me actually show you guys this picture here. So this is a chart that shows how you improve your strength over time and as you can see this hypertrophy hypertrophy means muscle mass building so it takes you a while before your muscles actually start growing a whole lot and what you see right away is strength and neural adaptation increasing right away and quite steeply so neural adaptation is you you training your neuromuscular system the electrical system that fires your muscles and almost all of your gains come from this right away and if you haven't been training very much you get huge gains from this um, so that's where a lot of your strength comes in. So you don't have to do a whole lot. People go way too hard when they start training uh, immediately. So, so what I would do for a beginner program is, if we look over here, this is that chart that we made, and this is my own chart here. What I would do is I would use 
this chart and then you just kind of scroll do down and make a beginner training workout. So let's just start with some muscle groups here. So we want to have a well-rounded uh, workout because I do think upper body is important for runners. But let's start with glute hamstrings. Uh, let's just say, well, let's just say uh, we're going to do lunges, right? So um, three by 10 lunges. That's pretty good to start. Uh, if we go down, push-ups are good, right? You want to have a good tight core when you're doing push-ups. So let's say three by 10 push-ups. We have some upper back stuff. Maybe you have a pull-up bar in your house and maybe you can't do very many pull-ups. So uh, you can do pull-up hangs, right? So you can just hang from the bar. Uh, you can do maybe, maybe just do one, three by one pull-ups, you know? Uh, you can get some straps to help you out. There, there are other ways to do pull-ups, but this is just a beginner exercise. Um, you can do like shoulder presses where you're just kind of raising your arms up, squeezing your shoulder blades together. Let me show you that. So, oh. so if you just kind of go like this, push your shoulder blades back together and go up, this will also train you to keep your shoulders back when you're running, and that'll help your, your arm carry there. So let's go back here. Okay, so we got pull-ups. Um, lower back supermans are really good for us, so three by 10 supermans. Again, when you're running, you wanna think about building your core up. Um, all right, let's see, crunches. We could do three by 10 crunches. And then uh, let's do calves. So three by 10 calves. All right, so that's actually a pretty good workout there. Nice beginner training workout for you. And again, what I would do is maybe switch it up in the week. So then instead of doing lunges, I might do squats. Instead of doing push-ups, you can you know, do chair dips, pull-ups. You can do uh, those arm raises that I talked about, uh, shoulder presses, right? Squeezing your shoulder blades together. Y you get the idea. So you can change that up quite a lot. Let's say you want to focus a little more on developing your power then. So a power workout would look something like this. Again, we're going to start with our legs. One of the techniques to building a good strength training program is you want to start with your larger muscle groups first and then move to your smaller because those larger muscle groups take more energy and more effort to com compete, complete those. So if you're doing like heavy squats or heavy lunges at the end of a workout, you're going to have a harder time. So let's say we're doing power. We're going to do three by 10 squats. And again, this is a beginner or, you know, how to start running. So um, you can do more than that. You can do up to 20, right? Especially since we're, some of us are quarantined. I would follow that up with maybe some box jumps or some broad jumps. So a broad jump is just standing with your two feet down and then trying to jump as far as you can or a box jump, you're jumping on top of a box. So, and since we're just, this is a starter, I would do um, two by, or well, three by two box jumps. So again, this is improving your explosion and you wanna start these slowly. I wouldn't, if you're not lifting at all, I would not start doing plyometrics or box jumps right away because that's gonna be uh, quite intense and you're gonna get very sore from it. So, and you don't need to right away because you're getting huge gains from just doing this beginner activity. If you did this kind of workout for about four weeks and then jumped over here, you would be, you'd be doing a really good setup, I guess. We'll just, we'll just leave it there. Then we'll do, uh, we can do three by 10 push-ups, let's say. And then if you want, you can, uh, you know, change this up and do rocky push-ups for more explosion. If that's something you want to do, um, you can do hip circles, right? That's kind of a hip exercise. You can look it up on Google, maybe uh, three by five each side. I really like hip circles. Um, add in some, man, supermans, they're just super good. One of the things when you're doing core work, you want to think about matching your core work with back work as well. So let's just do three by 10 supermans again. And then maybe uh, jump rope for your calves, right? So jump rope. And you can maybe do uh, three by 30 second. Sorry, that's a little bit hard to read, but 30 seconds of jumping rope. And so if you're going to make two of these workouts, then what I would do is uh, one day you do the, this power workout, then you maybe do three by 10 squats and then squat jump, or I mean, uh, 
three by 10 lunges and then maybe lunge jumps. You get the idea. So that's kind of how you do some strength workouts. Let me uh, check out the comments here. Um, oh yeah, yeah, so we're gonna actually build a hill workout right here um, and Okay, good, good questions. I'm gonna to get to those in a second here. So let's let's go on to an endurance workout. So um, when you're doing these, you wanna have easy days, all right? One of the things that people do when they start is they just go run hard every single day and then after three days they're shot and then they give up. So traditionally what you wanna do is you wanna go easy on easy days and you wanna go hard on hard days. Now, if you're beginning running, most of your days should be easy. So Maybe get after it with your strength for the first month and then just go on easy runs. Uh, one of the methods that I like is walk, run. I call it the walk, run method. So I see people on the green belt all the time running as hard as they can and just trying to maintain their pace and it looks miserable. And then it's like, well, yeah, no wonder everybody hates running, right? Let's, let's remove this. So when you're starting to get into running, you want to you know, maybe start out walking for five minutes until you feel like jogging a little bit. And then you run for a little bit. Once, you know, you're not having a good time anymore, stop and walk again. Then start running again and then walk again, right? Because when you're starting, you're just trying to develop your, you know, you're actually, you're actually developing strength from running in your lower limbs. And you're just slowly developing that cardio. So when we look back at this volume here, you don't need to do a whole lot, right? Maybe, maybe you're starting at 10 minutes a day, maybe 20 minutes a day, right? Half of that can be walking, uh, more than half can be walking. So I like the walk run method and that'll actually come into play. We can do hit workouts that way as well. So don't work too hard right away is my, is my point here. If we look at this chart again, you know, if you're doing a walk run method, maybe your walk is a two or a three and then your run is a five. That's a perfect way to build a base if you are not running at all. So. Let's say you've been doing this stuff for a week, you're getting, you know, maybe you're out running for four days a week, maybe three days a week, then you can start your workouts. Uh, actually, that brings up a good point. So consistency is super important when you are training for endurance because what happens is you have mitochondria and this is mitochondria density. And what happens is as you start training, your body starts producing more mitochondria and they go up real quick, and then they start to level off. And this is about week four here, week four. And then let's say you stop training. You lose about half your mitochondria in one week. So you wanna be consistent with your runs. So you don't need to run every day, but three or four days a week, if you can keep that consistent, you wanna try and keep that up because then you're not gonna lose your gains. Uh, you know, As you keep going, it slows down. And then, but it takes you about three weeks to bring that back up. So, so we want to be consistent. Okay. So let's say you've been doing that for a while. Let's, let's make a hit workout here. So you can do, this is kind of just like the walk run method. Um, you know, you do some type of warm up. Your warm up can be a walk, right? Just, I do that a lot of times when I'm not feeling like running. I'll go out into the foothills. I'll start walking. And then once I'm feeling good, then I'll just start doing a nice easy jog. And then, at some point, I might start running harder. So you, get, you want to take a nice, easy warm-up, and then uh, you could do anything you really want here. So you could, you could run hard for 30 seconds, you know, at like a 7 out of 10 effort. Um, and then you could rest for 30 seconds. Uh, and then, you know, so, so on, and then 30 seconds off, right? You can walk for that, and then you run again for 30 seconds, and you maybe do this times six that's a pretty good starting point that times six and then at the end cool down right maybe just a nice easy walk home then you'll be good to go so what you would do is you'd only do this once a week and i'm going to break it down into a weekly format as well uh, some other workouts we could do like a hill workout a hill workout is just a hit workout but i just call it a hill workout because you're on a hill so you know do a warm-up you can walk to a hill, you can jog to a hill, five or 10 minutes. Again, you just want a light sweat for that. And then you can, uh, if you find a hill that you like, you can run all the way up the hill. You can run up the hill for one minute. You can run up the hill for 30 seconds. So one minute on. You can walk back down the hill. Sometimes when I go into the foothills, I'll just, if I find a hill that I wanna run up, I'll attack it. And then 
when I'm tired and I feel like I got a good effort in, I'll walk for a little bit, then I'll start it again, you know, running hard again, and so on. So you could do this as you get better, times 10, right? And then maybe a 10 minute cool down. So this would be a 40 minute, 40 minute workout, which is quite long. You don't need to start that much, right? Again, uh, 15, 10, 15, 20 minutes if you haven't started anywhere. And I actually already created power. So um, that's up there. So that's pretty good. Let me put this into a weekly format and then I'll get to some of your questions. Oh yeah, you guys have really good questions. So nice work. All right. So when you're throwing these workouts into a weekly workout, I really think you should take at least one day off. If you're starting, maybe like three days off. So let's take Sundays off just because. And let's start throwing in some runs. And I'm gonna make this up, but you can do, you know, you can do it however you want. So let's say Monday, you're gonna just do an easy run, right? So maybe it's just a walk, just your walk run method for 15 minutes. Okay, the next day, maybe Tuesday, uh, well, let's just make, this is a starting. So you're starting from zero here. Maybe I would take Tuesday off. Good work, right? Next day, Wednesday, easy. Again, this walk-run method for uh, 15 minutes again. Yep. Okay, and then let's say Thursday, instead of taking it off, you are going to do a uh, resistance workout. So let's just call this strength strength right there so you just throw in this strength workout uh, no running that day and just work on becoming stronger all right then Friday you want to take Friday off and then Saturday you have a little bit more time so maybe just go do like an easy hike in the foothills with some friends maybe you can hike longer right so if you want to go for 40 minute 40 minute walk boom and then maybe following that, you and your friend, you want to go do another strength workout together, right? Just go do some push-ups or lunges, squats, that kind of stuff. So this would be a perfect beginning schedule because you got your two strength days here. You got your cardio there. And you're a little short on cardio, but not terrible for just starting out because you want to build up gradually. If you start out too soon, you're just going to destroy yourself. All right, so let's say, uh, let's make a follow-up week to that. So you walk for 15 minutes. So the next week you want to keep the same schedule. So walk, run method. Let's say you go for 20 minutes here. And again, if you start getting sore, take some extra time off because you recovering from your soreness is actually you getting better. And if you keep beating yourself up, you're not actually going to get better. So let's keep Tuesday off. Easy here. Run, let's say 25 minutes. You know, maybe you walked a little bit extra, so you got a little bit extra time in. And then we have uh, some strength here. Again, off. And then this time you went on a longer hike, right? Maybe a 60 minute hike. And then again, followed by strength. And then off. And again, you can do this however you want, right? So again, we have our three workouts and this is kind of all you need. So let's say you wanna implement some HIIT workouts You've been doing this for maybe a month, month and a half, and you're ready to add a little intensity. Although this walk run is kind of like a HIIT workout, but it's not as, um, I guess, intense. So let's keep Monday an easy day. Again, let's stick with that walk run because I, I really like it. Let's say you're up to, let's say you're up to 30 minutes now for those walk runs. Tuesday, you're still taking Tuesdays off. Maybe you work a long shift on Tuesday. Wednesday, let's try throwing in a workout. So. We could do a hill workout, um, hill workout. And let's just start with a basic one because when you're beginning, you wanna do an easy workout. So let's say you do a 10 minute warm up up to the hill, and then you're gonna do 30 seconds up the hill for, right? Fairly at a high intensity. And then you're gonna come down 30 second rest, maybe even a minute rest down the hill. And then you end with just a nice 10 minute walk, right? Cool down. And maybe you go up the hill six times. So six by 30 on, 30 rest. That's a pretty good beginner workout. I really like that setup. And with this, when you're looking at RPE, I'll bring that up again real quick. 
you know, when it's 30 seconds and you're starting, you probably want to start at a seven. But if you've been doing this workout maybe for a while, you can start getting up to that eight or nine. But in the beginning of your workouts, you want to be chill so that you can get through the whole thing running strong and running well. So then let's, uh, let's say you're back to an easy day and you're adding another day of running in. So another walk run day for you, another 30 minutes because you built up to this. And then, uh, oh, I forgot strength here. What I like to do with strength is I like to add it to the intense days because if you do a hard day and then followed by an easy day, this easy day is recovery and then this hard day is where you spike um, everything and then you get pretty sore but then you recover from that. So I would add strength to this day as you get better. See, you can do it however you want but in an ideal world you'd put a lot of your work into one day. So, And then I might even do one of those power workouts with some jumps, that kind of stuff. Friday, we'll keep Friday off. Saturday, maybe now you're doing hikes where you're walking and you're running for 60 minutes, right? So a walk, run method for 60 minutes. Follow, maybe, maybe you don't want to do strength anymore because that's a hard day. And then Sunday, you just finish it off with a strength day. So you're still getting two days off there, which I really like. Um, yep, and you can, you can switch this up however you want. As you get more intense, you might want to add two workouts, but I think right away, one workout a week with strength training and a longer day, I think that's a pretty good setup for most of us. So, okay, I'm gonna jump into the comments and then I have uh, another sheet of recovery, but a lot of your questions are focused on recovery. So let's check these out. All right, so first question, what hit workouts or would hit, hit workouts be beneficial? So just to recap on that, yes. So with hit workouts, you're really gonna be spiking your heart rate and improving that or building that lactic acid wherever my sheet is here. So when you're doing HIIT workouts, you are going to be, let's go over here, you're going to be improving your VO2 max and your lactic threshold. So super beneficial. Uh, but I would hold off right away and just kind of like slowly build into them. Okay, uh, what, are, what are some body weight exercises runners can do? So lunges are super good because you're isolating one leg. Lunge jumps, I really like power. Uh, so box jumps, lunge jumps, anything like that. Jumping jacks for calf plyometrics. Um, I like hip circles. So you get down on all fours and you kind of, um, if you've ever done fire hydrants, like a dog, right? You lift up your leg uh, to work your hip muscles. But instead you lift up your leg and just bring it all the way around, kind of like this, but with my leg, nice and slow. That's going to work a lot of really important hip um, muscles. So I like that exercise. Uh, I like hip raises where you just kind of, um, pressing your hips forward, laying on your back, uh, lifting your hips up. Those, your glutes, glutes are often neglected by runners, but your glutes are one of your largest movers for your legs. So uh, get really strong glutes. Hamstrings are really important. Quads are really important. Uh, I like push-ups still, pull-ups, just being strong overall. So, you know, I like the hip mobility and hip strength, but I also like overall body strength with those. So good question. I hope that um, answers it. How important do you believe it is to stretch before? All right, great question. So stretching prior to your, before you're warm is not effective really at all. So stretching before is a waste of time and I would not do it. Uh, what I would do is I would maybe for your, for your workouts here, um, let's say you're doing the walk run method. What I would do is I would start out walking and then maybe do a couple runs and you're gonna maybe be a little bit tight but as you warm up, you'll loosen up. And then if you're on the green belt, you can just stop somewhere in the grass once you have a light sweat going, and then you can do a really good stretch, right? Kind of go through some motions there and then finish up your workout. So don't be afraid to stop your run in the middle and stretch out a little bit. I think, I think people have this idea that they need to go out and run for 20 minutes nonstop. There is some benefit to that, but I think it's better to maybe take a little break in the middle and do some stretching there. So, uh, yep, middle, oh, I answered that. And yep, while you're running, answered that. So. Um, aside from that, as long as you have normal mobility and your hamstrings aren't tight or your hip flexors aren't tight or whatever, I think stretching can be overrated because just because having longer muscle length doesn't always lead to performance improvements. But if you're tight, then I think it's really important. So, um, yeah, I was, good question. Are we going over stretching in this class? Um, I might add something on Friday to the Friday discussion because I don't think I have a thing that 
refers directly to it. In my opinion, if you're doing lifts that are full body and full range of motion, what you're doing is you have muscle fibers and they slide in and out like this. And let me, let me switch this. So your muscle fibers slide together like this. And when you're doing like full range squats or RDLs or lunges, you're actually practicing moving those fibers in and out. And a lot of times what happens is as we damage our muscles when we're working out, those fibers tend to stick together and that can make us tight. And so uh, going through full range of motion exercises will help slide those and kind of make them function a lot better. Uh, I'm a big fan of foam rolling as well, but stretching also has a purpose. So 30 seconds seems to be enough. Other people would argue you need to stretch for five minutes to increase muscle length. Um, so yeah, if we want a stretching one, I'll try and ask, I'll try and uh, go more deep on our Friday question section. And I might add a session if I get lots of requests for stretching, but I hope that kind of helps. All right. Uh, where does one figure out what type of muscle fiber you have? Oh yeah, so that's actually quite intense. I don't know where you can do one in Boise. Uh, some physiology labs have the capability. We don't have that capability. Basically what they do is they shove this little needle into your muscle and they take a little snip of it and then they pull it out and you can dye the muscle and the different fibers become different colors and then you can actually uh, determine what type of muscle fibers you have and your breakdown. So it'd be like you have, and there's actually six types, but they're in the main, two main groups, type one and type two. So they could say you have 60% slow twitch, 40% fast twitch. And uh, I like to just think about what you're good at. Are you like really explosive? Are you really fast? Are you better at endurance? If you're better at endurance, you probably have slow twitch. If you're more of a sprinter, you probably have more fast twitch. And if you don't quite seem to be ideal at either, but you're decent at both, you're probably about 50-50. And the general population is 50-50. So, good question. Would running outside with hills build more strength compared to running on a treadmill? Yes. So, the muscle firing pattern of running on a treadmill is not the same as running on the ground because instead of pushing yourself forward, you're actually just moving your feet on the treadmill. So, one of the techniques that I do is I just add a little incline to the treadmill to try to avoid that. It's not perfect, um, but running uphill, very beneficial. It improves your form, improves your strength. Uh, yeah, I'm a big fan. So I like doing workouts up hills. I like doing easy runs up hills. I like walking up hills. I'm a big fan of hills. So yes, they will improve your strength. Next question, would running as, oh yeah, uh, after your workout and you become sore, is it better to take a day of rest or keep working out? either with more or less intensity? Perfect question. So the answer is both. So if you're really sore, a day off, I think can be really what you need. So that actually brings me up to my recovery sheet here. So after your workout, uh, if we're talking about this down here, light activity. So if you're really sore, maybe just go on a 10 minute walk the next day because your blood brings really good nutrients to your body. And so if you can regain that blood flow, that kind of helps flush out a lot of the inflammation that you get. And it can just help bring fresh supplies to heal the body overall. Um, but that doesn't mean that you need to do that every day. I mean, you should be a little active. You know, you can even do a 30 minute walk. Uh, walk right there. Oh, I'm writing on my paper for you guys. Let me bring that over. So right here. Yep. So light activity. I'm a big fan of that after a hard workout just something to flush your bloodstream and get new nutrients in. Although if you're really sore, a day off is great too. So I highly recommend at least one day off, up to three days off per week. And as you get better, these light, this light activity becomes more of a recovery activity. So if you're not running at all, or if you're not walking at all, a 30 minute walk might make you sore, right? So that's not gonna be a great post-workout activity if that's already making you sore. So it depends where you're at. But yes, light activity is pretty good and taking a day off is also good, whichever one you need to do. Okay, but yes, you wanna have high intensity days and low intensity days. That's gonna get your most uh, benefits and having about two high intensity days per week is about all you really need. Maybe three, but I think two is sufficient. Do you want to pair a run with a workout or should they be on different days? Oh yeah, I kinda answered that, but I like to pair a workout run with a strength workout. So, uh, and I would do the cardio first. Well, it depends, but you want to do some type of warm up anyways. So you can do an easy day where you go like for a 15 minute jog and then do your strength workout because then you get your cardio and you get your warm up in um, and then your strength workout. 
if it was me and I was really like trying to train at a high level, I would do my workout and a strength workout on the same day. And I might do a strength workout first. Um, I might do a strength workout in the morning so that I get most benefits from that and then go on a workout run when I'm tired. It depends at what point I am at in the season. And if you watch the how to train for endurance events, I'll get more into detail on that one. Um, what's the best way to control your breathing? Great question. So controlling your breathing, if you decrease the intensity, then you are going to be able to control your breathing more. So when I show this chart right here, I have your breath indicator here. And if your breathing gets away from you, then that just means you need to bring it back a little bit. And so that's kind of why I like the walk run method, because then you can start walking, bring your breathing back down, and then everything is good. Um, so yeah, so just go easier. Uh, if your breathing gets away from you, that's a good indication that you're at a seven or above. And so that's kind of where you want to be for your workouts. And then what I would do is if your breathing does get away from you, just run easier, get your breathing back, right? Get your composure back, and then you can push it hard again. And then you're just basically doing a organic hit training. Uh, you know, you don't need to plan everything. It doesn't need to be 30 seconds all the time. It can be, you know, uh, go hard until I don't want to go hard anymore. And then I rest until I don't want to rest anymore. And then I go hard again until I don't want to go hard. Uh, probably not the best way to maximize your performance, but it's still very effective, and most of my workouts are that way now. So um, is it more important to monitor our heart rate before or after running? Another good question. So you can measure your RPE based on your heart rate here. Uh, you'd have to get your max heart rate, but for most people, if you're above a heart rate of 160, you're probably above a 7 here. So you could do that. Uh, monitoring your heart rate in between runs can be good because if you notice that you're resting, let's say you measure your resting heart rate every morning when you wake up, if you notice your resting heart rate jump by like 10 beats, that's a sign that you're either getting sick or you're not recovered. And that's a good indicator that you should either take an off day or you should just take an easy day. Um, there's this other thing called heart rate variability. This is how quickly your heart is able to change between its, its beat cadence. And uh, I th some watches have those, a lot of smart Smart uh, watches have those. Uh, you can get a chest monitor, which would be better, but you know the wrist ones seem to be working pretty well. And you want a high heart rate variability. So you want your heart to be very responsive and to be able to change its cadence very quickly. And so if you have a high heart rate variability, that means that you are recovered and you're ready to go. If you have a low heart rate variability, then that means you need to take some more rest time. So great question. So both, I would say. Um, but you can do it through perceived exertion as well. All right, next question. Is there a difference between strength and resistance training? Uh, good question, slightly. So strength is going to be your maximum or how much you can lift. So strength is kind of like a one rep max. And so if you're really trying to train your strength, um, you're going to be doing sets of, I mean, if you're really trying to maximize your strength, you're going to be doing sets you're going to be lifting heavy enough to where you can only lift the weight like three to five times, maybe maybe even less. So uh, when we talk about some of the other uh, talks we'll have, we'll, we'll go more into strength training. Resistance training is all types of training. So plyometrics are a form of resistance training. Body weight workouts are a form of resistance training. Building muscle is resistance training. Strength training is resistance training. And in, a, in another video, I'm going to break those down into more detail. But if you do want to do strength with body weight, find a way so that your push-ups, where you can only do like six push-ups, right? So you can put your feet up on a bed. Um, it can be difficult without a weight room to do real good strength training. Um, but again, you're lifting super heavy to maximize strength. But if you're starting at ground zero, doing push-ups, 15 reps, 20 reps, 10 reps, all of that is going to be building your strength because again, if we look at this chart here, um, let's get this down you are going, your strength, as you can see, is, is going up quite a lot right away. So you don't need to get very specific with strength in order to get really good gains um, initially. So that uh, beginner workout that we have here, where did I put it? Oh. So this beginner workout here, if you're not doing anything, this will, this will really improve your strength without doing a whole lot. So. All right, a few more recovery things that I'm going to talk about here, and then we'll finish up. So nutrition is super important. 
after you do your workout, you should consume three to 400 calories for your recovery. So you want to consume carbs and protein. So the carbs help reduce muscle breakdown because they replenish your, your carbohydrate stores in your muscle. And then protein is going to help you rebuild that muscle. So uh, chocolate milk is really good if you can eat that or drink that. Um, you know, pretzels are actually pretty solid. You know, you can do your, your post-workout drink or whatever. You can eat a Cliff Bar um, or any other kind of bar. But you want to get some good protein and some good carbohydrates for your nutrition afterwards. And just in general, you want to make sure you're eating enough because that food that you're eating is going to be repairing your muscles and rebuilding you into a stronger human. Next is sleep. I, we've talked about sleep and I showed that chart. If you're sleeping about nine hours a night, that shows that athletes sleeping nine hours get the most recovery and the least amount of injuries. So sleep is super important. You also increase your testosterone. Um, don't worry, ladies, you're not going to increase your testosterone too much. You're going to increase your human growth hormone. And people dope with these things, right? But from sleep, you can get them. So if you're not sleeping eight hours, you're, you're basically not doping like you should, right? And then for another recovery thing, foam rolling. I'm actually a bigger fan of foam rolling than stretching. So this kind of goes into that debate. Foam rolling, let me switch back over to myself here. When I talked about those muscle fibers like this, uh, with foam rolling, well, with stretching, what you're doing is you're pulling those muscle fibers this way. And when you're foam rolling, what you're doing is you're kind of pressing these muscle fibers around and you're kind of loosening them up because that foam roller is pressing on your muscle. And sometimes foam rolling is quite painful. You don't have to foam roll so hard that it's painful. But if you just foam roll lightly, you're just going to be massaging those muscles. And a foam roll is like a massage and it's also like a stretch. So if I had a piece of fabric here, well, actually, I'll use this. So imagine that this is your muscle here. Let's turn this sideways. So what you're doing when you are foam rolling is you're kind of pressing your muscle this way and you're stretching your muscle out this way rather than long like this when you're just stretching your, like your hamstrings, for instance. So through any type of massage, whether it's an actual massage or a foam roll, you're stretching your muscle this way, which I'm a big fan of, and it really kind of moves those muscle fibers around and makes them slide in and out. So a lot of times when I have kind of a sore back, uh, sometimes in my upper back, all foam roll, um, especially after doing a workout, is really effective because you're already warm, and I'll almost instantly feel better from that. So big fan of foam rolling there. Um, I have another question. What food is the best nutrition recovery? So I kind of answered that, but just to highlight this, I'm a big fan of chocolate milk. If we're talking about getting really um, efficient with it, you want a ratio of four grams of carbs to one gram of protein. So protein, carbs. So if you're looking at labels, it turns out that chocolate milk is actually perfect for this. Uh, pretzels are pretty good. Some people would argue seven grams of carbs to one gram of protein. Pretzels meet that build. Cliff bars are pretty close as well. A lot of the workout shakes right now are removing carbs uh, just because, you know, there's a, a low carb trend. I am a fan of keeping carbs in there. So I would add, oh, I'm not showing you guys this. There we go. So four grams of carbs over one gram of protein is going to be chocolate milk. Pretzels are going to be seven grams of carbs over one gram of protein. You can eat your meal right afterwards. So if you eat like eggs and hash browns, there you go, uh, bacon and pancakes, right? Um, these are more like recovery snacks and then, you know, you could eat a meal later. Uh, but really, if you don't have anything, I mean, an apple and peanut butter is really good. If you don't have anything uh, else, I would just um, eat anything, right? Any type of, even if you don't have protein, just eat some carbs. Eat some bread, peanut butter and jelly sandwich works really well. Uh, cheese stick, um, you know, just consume some type of food after your workout and then you'll get more recovery out of it. So if you're not eating right after your workout, you're kind of wasting some of your gains a little bit. So, all right. Well, good questions. I think that is enough for us right now. If we have any more, I'll hang out. But other than that, we are done and you guys can go ahead and log off. Thanks for joining. And uh, yep, we'll be doing this all week.